Okay, so good morning, everybody. Welcome back, right? Day two of the workshop. Um, before I get talking a little bit about digital humanities broadly and some of the different um, digital humanities projects and the platform we'll be using, um, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet. So this sign-up sheet, we're just asking for your name and your email address, and this is your email address that you want to be associated with your Omeka site, right? Did I miss anything? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so that's it. So um, I guess you can change it later on, but for now, um, this is what we're going to use to get you guys all set up with your own Omeka accounts. So I'll start it at that corner. There's a pen sign-up sheet, and this can just sign up. Okay, so while that's getting passed around, I do want to take um, a little time to recap from yesterday and kind of reiterate and explain upon um, some of the things that came up yesterday, right? Um, and a, Mimi, I said earlier, right, thank you for kind of organizing that really nice introduction yesterday. So Gabriel Melendez, when, Dr. Gabriel Melendez, when he read from his book of archives, he said, um, the totality of community is memory, right? And this idea of memory and the importance of memory and collecting these stories is a theme that carries through in David's song, right? Um, and also in the poem, I forget the title, was it Siéntate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? <laughs> um, of the poem yesterday. And so I think that's important to kind of think about as we're talking about these, um, di these digital projects and especially the Manitos project, right? Um, also, there's these ideas that um, what, how do the digital, how do the humanities and the digital combine, right? At one point, I think Mimi even asked the question of what is, what is a national, what is a community archive as opposed to say a national archive or a state archive, right? And she kind of posed that question. And I just think that I would like to start today about maybe fleshing that out a little bit. I don't think we're gonna come out with like, one answer, but I would like to get people kind of at least thinking about this before we start um, looking at some of the different Omeka and digital projects. So she asked, right, in a quote, what, how are community archives different, right? Um, so how might we wrestle with these notions? So what is, a, what constitutes a national archive, right? And at this point, you can just raise your hands and we can have a, a conversation. It's a national archive. What, what makes a national archive? Huh. It comes from everywhere, and there's not necessarily any personal connection to the things that are there. Okay, yeah, so it comes from everywhere, and there's no personal connections necessarily to the things that are there, right? And by everywhere, maybe we're talking about the nation, right? Mm -hmm. Someone else had their hand up. So, so it's shareable. It's shareable throughout. Right, we can share it. It's available, right, for like meaning making. What else? Come? Yes. Uh, it's, it's tax funded by the people. Okay, it's funded, right, by the people, by the government, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. There are a lot of rooms. There aren't a lot of restrictions on um, use of it. Say if you want to use it in a different um, format or incorporate it, um, like you don't have to often pay any hall fees or a lot of fees. It's not collected by a, a private entity. Yes, right. So it's made available. Um, there's limited restrictions. You can use it. It's part of like this like um, of the shared knowledge in some ways. Yeah. And it never gets lost. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> I mean, so I think that's a really important point is that, um, and maybe we can talk about this as we move forward, but this idea that it never gets lost, on the one hand, I think 
think we'd hope to think so, right? But I think in the <laughs> but in the recent fires, right? Uh, I'm thinking of like Brazil and some other places where like their archives have literally gone up in flames, right? And what happens with these materials? And so in that sense, these materials are always fragile, right? Even if we'd like to think they never get lost. And I remember there was a call for people who had visited to please send pictures, right, of artifacts, of things they had seen to try to recreate this National Archive, right? And so um, it's something different to think about these materials not being there forever or getting destroyed in some sense, right? Natural disasters, Carmen. Well, that brings up the idea that you remember about, what, 10 or 15 years ago, these National Archives started digitizing and it just seemed so strange at the time. It's, and they were, some were hesitant to do it and others weren't. And now everything seems to be available online. Yes, right? And so there's this push to digitize. Things are available online. Um, and we can talk about this during break. So I don't want to spend too much. But, but it was really, I'm thinking about this because of the impetus of that response, right? That they never get lost. And, and I think that is part of this like national archival memory that things don't get lost. But because I work a lot with Latin America, so I, am, uh, I should have started with an introduction, right? I'm the... Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Latin American and Caribbean studies housed in the library. And so there's a lot of human rights issues with governments and the nation in places like Guatemala, where the government is systemically trying to destroy these periods of human rights violations, right? And so then what happens to these um, materials, right, that are everywhere and tax funded, for example? Yes. Yeah, the um, loss of the actual material, like periodicals that have been digitized, have, a lot of libraries have just destroyed the actual object. I mean, is that? So um, we have a UNM archivist in the room. I don't know if libraries, I, I don't think it's fair to say that they destroy the materials after they're digitized. We strongly recommend that that not happen. Right, okay. Although some people do see digitism. One of the big problems in archives is we do not have space for all the paper records. And so some people think that if you digitize something that you can then get rid of the paper record because you already have a copy of it. But it's much harder to actually preserve the digital copy than the paper copy, so we do not recommend at all getting rid of things once you have digitized them. Right, and you don't need internet access or a platform, right, to see this paper copy. Um, any other thoughts about national archives that kind of go along state archives? What about a community? Oh, yes, some more hands. Regarding access, a national yeah. archive will actually have entire sections that are not available widely to the public. For instance, our national archives in D.C., there's an entire section that is secret and or top secret that you have to have clearance to be able to access. To be able to access, Whereas yes. A community, with a community archive, there are likely not going to be those kinds of restrictions. There's those restrictions, that right. Part of their mission is to make things available to the open public. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the advantages of a national thing is there's people who are coming in and photographing it, mm -hmm. um, like the, the building that don't, no longer exists. She was able yeah. to virtual. You can do 3D modeling of things and so on and so forth. And all you got to do is collect those pictures. Yeah. And, and I be think Shane had a really good example of that yesterday, right? Of a 3D model, of something of a building that mm -hmm. no longer exists, um, right? There's yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. David. I wanted to kind of revisit that idea that uh, local archives are somewhat easierly accessible than, than national archives in terms of uh, sensitive materials because also local archives may have you know various sensitive materials which may be a detriment to that community to have a public. Uh, yeah. And it's all the idea about having uh, uh, you know uh, access, whether it be you know cultural mapping to you know sacred sites. 
where such, such information would be uh, would, 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 uh, would, uh, disempower the community for them to have that sort of information out into the public. And so, uh, and so it, it, it depends on the material itself. Absolutely, yeah. So it depends on this material, right? Of like, like you just said, sacred site, things that would be a detriment to the community. I'm thinking right now with the, you know, the, the immigration status and deportation, right? There's some oral histories of that are gathering nar narratives of of immigrant communities that would be a detriment, right? If we found out their names, where they live, and so I think that um, we're kind of moving into this direction of thinking about what are the importance of community archives, right? So not everything is available. Some things. What else is? So now we move down to community. What is a community archive? And how does it maybe differ? And I think we're getting at that. Yeah. I think oftentimes community archives represent more marginalized groups. Yes. Yeah. Just from my little experience, I found that it's less likely to have a cataloging system that's like searchable online for you. You're more likely to have to make an appointment with the archivist. And it's kind of helpful in a way because you build a relationship with that person. Okay. In a way. Right, they right. They know what you're looking for. They know kind of what your organization is all about. And they can reach out to other members in the community that have your same interests. Yes. Right. And, and I think that depending on what group it is, it can really show that group that what their activities have been are important yes. and have right. value and meaning in a broader sense. Thank you, Carmen. Yes, right, that these activities of the marginalized, right, are important. Someone else have their hand up. Um, I know that the history that we um, keep is um, very personal. Okay. We have yes. family Bibles, uh, we have uh, sermons, we have church records. Right, so that kinds of things, um, church records, family records, and maybe they're in shoe boxes, maybe not right, but the, the kind of the ephemera, the kind of materials that we keep. We have also have um, report cards. Oh, report cards! Oh. You are. Is that okay? Um, or do you want to wait? Charles told me that we want to call the power. Okay. So. Um, and I gotta open up all my tabs again. Do you have a break coming up? We do. Um, let's just leave that then for a minute and then maybe we'll go get you guys on the break too. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Um, sorry. Um, this seems sort of relevant to share. This is a stud circle story. So this sort of our, yeah. You know, foundation and he um, at the beginning of his doing recordings he was with a woman in a housing project in South Chicago and he recorded her and she had you know family running around and anyway at the end of the recording he asked her do you want to hear what I've recorded and she started to listen and then she puts her hands to her face she goes, oh my God, I never knew I thought that. Uh -oh. And so I think that, in terms of local archives, I think we don't value a lot of times what our experiences are and the sharing of it. Yes. And so that it actually exists in that way, not just through our own head, but through to be shared but broader. To be shared, yeah. yes. Yeah, and I think that the, the power of community archives, um, and it was also kind of hinted at yesterday is this idea of like, oh, decolonizing methodologies, right? So these like national archives are, are creating this national memory, right? That serves for negotiating power and who belongs. Um, and so oftentimes, um, as you guys have all said, marginalized communities, the personal, right, are left out of those national archives. Um, some of, one of the, Actually, the Southeast Asian Digital Archive, 
um, asks, the impetus for this was, um, what does it mean to be omitted from history books? Right? What are the implications of not being able to find any traces of the last left by of the what are the implications of not being able to find any traces of the past left by people who look like you? Right? Share your cultural background or speak the same native tongue, for example. What do archival absences have on how you might understand your place in history? Right? So I think these are all really good questions to get us thinking about community archives, how they resist that, how they create this knowledge base of shared knowledge. And I think especially to David's point that, oh, well, maybe some things would be a detriment. The difference is that the community is making those decisions. Right? And so it's not that everything is all knowable and we got to share with everybody, but it is that the community is making, right? It's not a top-down approach. Um, and this came up yesterday when someone asked a question about Facebook. Well, what do we do if someone doesn't want their name? And I think Mimi said, well, then you don't have to share it, right? There's decision-making and power that's, that's put back into the community's hands. Um, So, the digital, right? So we've talked about archives, so where does the digital fall into play here? How does that work? And we said, okay, you know, this is a digital project. And so, um, how do we see that playing in this conversations of archives and community archives? This was also touched upon yesterday, the introduction. Yeah. These are my things. Each individual family has their things. So making these things digital allows them to share them while keeping them. Yes. And uh, there might be things in museums in Santa Fe that come from that community that no one has ever seen that they might be able to actually see digitally. Right, yeah, absolutely. And so the one hand, it allows the people to maintain ownership, right? So it's no longer this colonial model of like, this is wonderful, let me take it now and put it behind some glass, right? It maintains, the actual artifact stays in the, in the hands of the families, right? And then so in libraries, um, we've also kind of started to take on this model and it's called a post-custodial post, post model, right? Where we digitize, but we don't have to actually go in and take the actual artifact from the families, from the archives in which it belongs. And so that's one way I think that the digital is kind of helping this community is that it, the power, the artifact, the, the pictures, right, stay with those families. Yeah. Um, it helps communities connect across the diasporas. Yes. So that way um, uh, communities that aren't in the same region can, can see what other communities are doing like them. and. Uh, you know, connect dots. Yeah, it helps communities um, connect across diasporas, right? And so I think Mimi was talked a little bit, and, and there she is, I keep mentioning, right, your name, and I don't say it, but you talked about being culturally near but geographically distant and how, right, the digital allows us to kind of re out, reach out across diasporas, right, kind of collapse this time and space to share with others. Right, who kind of have that that shared meaning making. So I think it it, it allows the community to tell its own story, and yes. uh, and it also educates the community within because the more um, the digital information is out there, you receive back um, you know information in addition to or how it relates, and uh, the community actually ends up getting. Or educated a lot of times. I too. think so, right? Understand. Absolutely. And even if we think back to um, the poem yesterday of like, okay, wanting to like kind of connect with another generation and, and like, uh, well, guess what? So many. Yesterday, Shane said, how many of you guys have an iPhone? How many of you guys have a Droid? I think everybody raised their hand, but this idea that you can access these materials through an iPhone, right? And so it's even in that sense, also, I think maybe crossing generations, right, who can now 
have access to these materials without going to what we think of a traditional archive, but through these digital platforms and exhibits. Yeah, and so um, I just, did, you know, as we're kind of talking about this, I just wanted to say two things. The first one is that um, the kind of technological stuff that we're going to be working on later on today and learning Omeka and digitizing, right, that's, that's intertwined always with the archive and the community building, right? They're not two separate things, but I think they're, they're interconnected. And I think for like uh, digital humanities and also for these like Latinx digital projects, right, it's important to see them as, as constantly in communication with each other, right? Um, so this idea about diaspora, so now I'm gonna actually turn to a few of um, exhibits, digital exhibits, that I think really reinforce the kinds of ideas that we've been talking about. So um, this idea of diaspora, right, and connecting people across different diasporas, um, I'm really drawn to that idea, and um, Georgetown University has, um, I think, implemented this really um, thoughtful digital project, right? And so um, I have a few notes because I won't remember everything, but let's see, where is it? Okay, yeah, so, um, so Georgetown was founded, university was founded in 1789, right? It's one of the oldest Catholic and Jesuit universities. Um, and, and, um, and it was, so it has this relation to slavery, right? As a matter of fact, the Jesuits were, I think they said the largest, they owned the largest amount of slaves in the area, right? So in, 17, in 1839, um, the university, like so many universities, um, has some kind of financial trouble, right? So the then Jesuit priest who, you know, I guess by today's standards is the president, sells 272 enslaved persons to help fund the university, right? In, tw um, in 19, so that's in, eight, in 1839. In 1977, the library gets um, the Maryland Province archives donated to them. And in this archive are the records of the sale, right, like names and details of these um, enslaved persons. And so the university is now tasked with how do we have, what do we do, right? How do we kind of approach this? And I went to several panels um, of the folks who led this, um, led this initiative. So, what they end up doing is um, reaching out to communities. They hire a genealogist, right, to try to find these communities. Because what does it mean to put up these records and have these names when there might be descendants out there that recognize those names, right? And so um, that was the gist of this project. How do we make these records available? Do we add? we have to involve the community and we have to involve the descendants, right? Um, and so those are kind of some of the, the factors that went behind this. So, um, and part of that initiative, they created a working group. Um, amongst other things, they changed names on campus. So one of the campus buildings, for example, was named after that Jesuit priest who sold. And so they named, they renamed the hall. Right, so this, and, and this is kind of stuff that has been going on, most, especially recently in the South with statues and buildings and stuff. And so, um, this is their Omeka site, right? And so, um, you have some stuff on the working group, right? They make everything transparent, right? The working group, how they went about it. Um, they have a historical timeline. Let me see if I can close this. And so you can see this is with items. And this is an Omeka site uploaded. And if you guys, um, it's just slavery.georgetown.edu. If you guys want to kind of get in and kind of look around. And they have a 
an archive, right? The slavery archive. For all of these items have di been digitized. So if you click an item, for example, you get the title, the subject, the description, the creator, all items will be going to, right, the next session we will go over these fields. Um, you have a map, you have collections, right? Descendant stories, family histories, biographies, oral and video history. So you can tell. Um, there was this really interesting podcast that I listened to not too long ago. Um, through this, these records, they were able to um, find out that that sale, those um, enslaved people were sent to Louisiana. Right, and um, through kind of genealogical history and investigating, they were able to actually find descendants in Louisiana. And it made so much sense to them because they said, you know, we didn't speak French, we spoke English, and we were Catholic, right? So, and there was oral histories that we had come from Baltimore, but how did we get here? And so it was really interesting to see this kind of full circle of how this project kind of reached the community and the descendants. So, um, another, right, since we're just kind of showcasing digital projects, and this is just a few of the projects that exist, right? Um, is the Chicana, Chicano activism in the Southern Plains through time and space. And so basically this project um, finds a void in the Chicano movement saying that scholars have spent so much time investigating the Chicano movement in these large urban settings, right? Um, but what about the small rural communities, especially the Southern Plains, right? What did active, it's been, it hasn't been studied Want to say something, no, Carmen? I didn't know about this. I'm yeah. excited. Okay, yay! <laughs> right? Um, and so they basically have taken that void and created this project of what it looks like, right? What Chicano Act, the Chicano Rights Movement looked like in the Southern Plains. They have a map, um, just like the slavery project. There's an interactive is it coming up? timeline. Items, right? Things that people that he digitized and put up, right? So here you have the title, description, right? And I'm kind of talking about title, description, creator because this is going to come up again later, right? Um, when we digitize our own items and we have to kind of put them in this Omeka platform. Um, so that is the plainsmovement.com. The other project is the South A Southeast Asian Di Digital Archive, and this is a community-based archive documenting the diverse histories of Southeast Asian Americans. Right? Um, it's kind. Of, it's grown. There's access to the archive um, stuff for teachers, for example. So it's really kind of making these materials available, right? And in different in different ways. Chicana por mi raza, right? Who now is a different look at the Chicano movement. So if the, um, what does this have? The, the Southeast, the South, the Plains archive, right, was looking at, okay, why has this, the history of the Chicano movement been largely understudied outside of large urban settings? Well, there's still another void that Maria Cotera finds, and that is the women's movement and the Chicano movement, right? And um, so not only does she notice this gap in that women's movements are not kind of really studied or front and center in the Chicano movement, 
She also says they're essentially being erased also from the National Women's Movement because in 2005 they go to one of the 30th reunions and none of the original Chicanas that were in that 1977 meeting were even recognized, right? And there was one Chicana keynote speaker. And so part of these absences, right, these absences of history, of when you don't see your communities, well, how do we make, you right, Guadera says, she, you know, you're risking erasure of, the, of, of, of consciousness, right? And so this is one site um, that is just robust. Um, you, again, there's recent uploads, right? Here's a bumper sticker, right? From 1968, the Chicano strike. Um, there's, let's see, let me see if I can find that. I think there's over 150 oral interviews that um, you can join the collective and have students participate and help collect these stories. Um, and put them up. So it's really this. It's it's a com it's a community effort, right, to get these materials up. Um, so, are there any kind of questions or anything you guys want to ask, or you want some time to um, maybe even look through some of these different? Examples, and I say that only so we can get this restarted, <laughs> right? For because next time we, I think we will need the three screens for once we kind of get it logged into Omeka, so we can have a discussion. Um, maybe Amy can get. Should we get? Um, okay, okay, okay. Perfect, perfect. I was just wondering, are each of these examples using the Omeka platform in different ways or integrating that into the sites, or are they all? Yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see. So I kind of anticipated this question. So the Chicana Purmirasa is not an Omeka site, right? It is a Drupal site. Uh-huh, yes, yeah, yeah. But the slavery, the Georgetown Slavery Archive, right, is Omeka. And the Plains Movement is Omeka, right? Um, Southeast, um, what's this? Um, oh, another one that is an Omeka site is, oh, the Bracero History Archive. And I didn't talk about that one, but that is Omeka. So yes. what's the difference? Right. <laughs> what's the difference? And I think um, they all have differences, right? I think as far as like plugins and what they do, and I think we might be talking a little bit about this tomorrow. Am I right? Corn. No? We can talk about it tomorrow. Okay. I guess the short answer for now is that, sorry, it's kind of the corner. Drupal and other platforms like that that we're managing, we're using really big, complicated websites with lots of different content, with lots of different Lots of different stuff. Businesses use them for their corporate websites. Very, they're, they, they're meant to handle a level of complexity that we don't really worry about right now. Well, that guy's meant for archiving stuff. It's a digital archive for everyone to use. It's very easy. It's a low barrier entry. Drupal and other content management sites like that take a lot of learning just the basics of how to use a very complicated interface. They do a lot of really simple work. Well, that makes it a lot easier to do the work we want to do, which is digitize things, create a record for them, associate metadata with it, and access it, and then tell stories about it. That's what the, that's what the power of Omega is. You can use other tools like Drupal or other content management systems to do those things, but that's not really what it's fundamentally designed to do. It's meant to be a much, much broader, more general tool that makes it more complicated, it makes it harder to maintain, harder to learn. Uh, you get a little bit more flexibility in certain areas, but it's hard to use that because you have to constantly be learning how to use this very general tool. Uh, so we're using a tool that's more focused on Mecca. We're using that tool because it's more focused on exactly what we want to do. Uh, and it allows us, uh, and it's just the, the best first step forward. If, our, if everything becomes so complicated that we need to think about moving to a sort of more powerful platform, we can talk about that in the next number of years when we get to that point. But for now, that is definitely. 
uh, the best, best way to begin. Thanks, Fred. Mimi? Yeah, I just want to add to that that um, part of the process that we proposed to Mellon was actually to choose a content management system. And I think by the time we reached proposal phase, we had narrowed it down to four. And one of the not insignificant advantages was when we uh, started talking to people at UNM and realized that they were aware we had expertise here and people using it at, at, at the libraries here was a, was a huge uh, factor in kind of helping us make the final decision and um, to the point of the individual libraries and villages saying we don't have capacity to be able to administer this thing on our own. We need administrative support from institutional partners and this just seemed like a perfect uh, way to work together. And it's also, it's very focused. We looked at, the, the other things we looked at looked more like library-ish, you know, and this, um, they, there's, they sort of excel at the sort of public facing side of things and the exhibit side of things, which is also important to the community. It's not like we're trying to be, to emulate an institutional collection. We're trying to share cultural information. Examples out there, more on Mecca um, examples that kind of range subjects and topics. I picked a few that I think um, related to kind of the impetus for this Manitos project, right? To get like local histories and stories that risk being forgotten kind of out. And so these projects were similar um, in scope and content. Um, but there's plenty, plenty out there. Um, and I just also wanted to kind of wrap this up also by saying that um, <clears throat> part of this community archives that I think is exemplified by these exhibits, by, the exhi by this Manitos project that we're working on, is that it's broad participation, right? So, you know, we're examples of that going on here, going back to their communities, reaching out across just diasporas. Um, there's also this like kind of shared ongoing stewardship as we're all kind of learning the platform, right? And there's some support, um, but there's also, I think, most importantly, that um, you know, I can't really don't want to demo each site because that kind of gets worn. But I think the difference, um, especially through these community projects and archives, is that there's a multiplicity of voices. Right, that sometimes get lost in like nar larger national but even state archives, right? And I think that um, even just seeing the interested and in all the different technologies that Shane was talking about yesterday and starting to think about the own materials that we're each bringing and finding on our community will reveal itself as we continue through these projects, right? These different um, voices. Um, also thinking about, um, especially with the Plains movement, even the slavery archive and the Chicana por mi raza, is this idea of um, thinking about maybe positioning archival collecting as a form of activism, right? As this form of like reclaiming a history, a voice, right? That's been forgotten and negated. And so, um, like Mimi, I might leave us with more question of what does it look like if we think about this archiving as a form of activism, right? Um, and most importantly, there's this ongoing reflexivity about the shifting nature of identity and community that I think um, was brought at the forefront yesterday with some of the questions, with when we're asking, when we're dealing with family members, and um, right, I think as we start looking at the different items and dealing with the communities, these things, you know, it's not a one and done. I think there con there's a constant negotiation about, um, and conversation about what this looks like, negotiating identities, self-reflexivity, and so forth. Yeah. Um, a long time ago, it was in Pennsylvania. I worked with the African American Heritage Museum, and what we were doing was getting a lot of documentation from families. I know this sounds odd, but we were looking at 
newspaper clippings, of uh, obituaries, and it was predominantly African Americans from African descent. And we were also even getting church bulletins and scanning them because in just that one bulletin or that one obituary in a paper from these people, it gave the whole history of that person's life. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I'm wondering how we're going to incorporate, you know, I mean, we can scan those and incorporate them as well. But so that this whole project, what I'm really excited about is working with people that, you know, are here, and I'd like to get the oldest possible people. I know this sounds odd, but the thing is, I know a couple of World War II veterans that are still very, and for to hear, one, one is male, he's 94, and to hear his story, I think it's going to be exciting. Another thing we ought to remember is that our own nation, in the, in the turn of the century, um, we have two really dark eyes dark spots just in the 1900s, and it's taking all the Native Americans away from their families and sending them to dormitories. These people are, some of these people are still alive, and I'd love to capture their stories, and, and you know, it does, I've always seen that with such a negative connotation, and the people that have come into my museum have been saying other things, oh no, it wasn't that bad, I was going to get a picture. That surprised me, because I've never heard that aspect. The other one is the Japanese Americans. When we as a nation, you know, enslave almost 130,000 people, um, is anyone, I'm wondering even if anyone's documenting that. There is, and I can't, think, and, I, and I'm trying to remember right off the, the top of my mind, and I can't, but um, Gail Okinawa, right, is um, a scholar. Yes, um, yeah, so she, what she does is she traces her um, grandfather's story through National Archives, places him in a Santa Fe internment camp that no longer exists literally, right? It's like a housing community, right? And so, you know, she grapples with this idea of like, not only how to make sense of this history that's also been, um, wasn't really talked about, but also making her way over here and seeing that that site no longer exists, right? Um, but there is a digital component, and, and I'll find it during our break. I just can't think of it, but but yes, that's that's happening. And I also think it's important that, um, you know, and this is just my personal belief, is kind of what you're saying is that I, we can't really prescribe what it is we're gonna find, right? Um, we gotta just kind of go, um, this gentleman and then Carmen. That person's silent. someplace and I'll, I'll share it later but there is yeah 
Um, I was involved with a film that we went to go do a documentary, and one of the people that I worked with was uh, a veteran from World War II. He was so elderly, but he sat on his stoop where he was actually born and told us about what Austin used to look like, and just there was just so much history that came out of this man's mouth, it was unbelievable. And he was black, if it makes a difference. But, but it was just, it was unbelievable to put that in, you know, solid documentation, because I don't know if he's still alive now. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, this was just kind of serving as an introduction to kind of the project, thinking about the project, looking at how these projects transcend to like digital exhibits, right? Um, and so I think I'm done a little early, but we're going to restart the computers, get back, and then actually look into the platform and see if we can get our hands on what this stuff looks like at the back end. Doesn't look this pretty, right? <laughs>